Dang it. Finally got the house all to myself, got the game on the big screen, two cold ones down, and more chilling in the mini cooler right next to my lazy boy. And now someone's calling on the phone. Better not be one of those annoying sales calls or a robocall. Someone's about to get an earful. It was around 8 p.m. on a Wednesday night. My wife, Tracy, usually worked late on Wednesdays, so I always planned for a fun night out or a relaxing night in. Tonight was a chill night at home. I already polished off a medium meats pizza from Papa John's earlier with a couple of brews, then kicked back to watch the Cubs game with a few Coronas. I had two more waiting for me in the cooler and another six in the fridge in the kitchen. It was shaping up to be a great night. Tracy would stroll in around 10, freshen up with a quick shower, and then we'd be cuddled up by around 11. Wednesdays were always low-key at the Avondales. This phone call, though, was like a punch to my good vibes. I just had a feeling it wasn't going to be good news. But being the responsible guy I am, I picked up anyway. Turns out it was Shell Tremaine, the wife of Tracy's boss, Jacques, and she sounded on the verge of a breakdown. Turns out Jacques had a heart attack while he was at work with Tracy, my wife. Tracy called 911, and they rushed him to the hospital in bad shape. Shell told me Tracy went with Jacques in the ambulance and would need a ride home since Shell planned to stay with Jacques as long as he needed her. I assured her I was on my way and wished Jacques all the best. Jacques had been Tracy's boss for 22 years. She started working for his software company right out of college and had worked her way up to being his right-hand woman, so to speak, as well as his work wife. I was already dating Tracy when she started working for Jacques, and over the years, our families have done things together. He always seemed like a good guy, and Tracy said he was an amazing boss who took good care of her, including in the paycheck department. Jacques, a French citizen, is 55 years old, which makes him 10 years older than Tracy and me. He's a good-looking guy who stays in shape and has a decent physique for his age. He has a vibrant personality and tends to attract attention wherever he goes. People, both men and women, are drawn to him. Despite knowing that everyone has their own fate, regardless of how well they take care of themselves, I was surprised when Jacques had a heart attack. I parked my car in the visitor's lot near the emergency room, walked in, and asked about Jacques. I told the nurse at the desk that I was the husband of the woman who had come in with him and that I was also looking for her. As I said this, I noticed a pair of EMTs to my right. One of them quietly tapped the other on the forearm and whispered, just loud enough for me to hear, Wussy's here. Wonder which way this'll go. Although he seemed to be talking about me, I had no idea what he meant. I didn't know what a wussy was, and I didn't really care at that moment. I was solely focused on finding Tracy. Five minutes later, Tracy and Chell both emerged from a room, tears streaming down their faces. They spotted me and came over, and we hugged each other tightly. He's gone, Rick, Tracy said, her voice breaking as we hugged. He passed away a few minutes ago. The doctor said it was a massive heart attack. He's gone. I was speechless as we stood there in the hallway all three of us holding each other tightly, both women crying uncontrollably. Shell, who is also from France, had been married to Jacques for 35 years. They tied the knot when they were both 20 and moved to this country when Jacques landed a job with an American software company at the start of the computer era. They have a daughter named Amy, who is three years older than my daughter Allison, who is 18. The girls resemble each other enough to be mistaken for sisters. Jacques cherished Amy, and I knew this would be especially tough on her. Just then, one of the EMTs approached me and asked if I was Tracy's husband. I confirmed, and he handed me Tracy's purse, saying she left it in the ambulance when they arrived at the hospital. As I took it in my left hand, I thanked him and shook his right hand with mine. While I started to adjust the dangling strap to secure the purse, I thought I saw a bra stuffed inside. It didn't make sense to me, so I took a closer look, and indeed, there was a bra tucked into the purse. Things were so chaotic when the women came out of the room crying that I didn't really get a good look at Tracy. I noticed she wasn't wearing a bra, which struck me as odd. I'm not sure how much longer we stayed at the hospital with Chell before she decided it was time to go. Amy was coming back from her university in the morning, and Chell wanted to get some rest. I drove Chell home and then took Tracy and me to our house. I figured I could help both women retrieve their cars tomorrow. Chell's from the emergency room parking lot, and Tracy's from her work lot. Tracy didn't say a word to me when we walked in the door. She went straight to the main bathroom and took a shower. About 20 minutes later, she came into the family room, her eyes red and swollen from crying. She sat on the sofa, and I left my lazy boy chair to sit beside her, pulling her into a tight hug. She was breathing heavily, and I could feel her body shaking with sobs. I wanted to ask her about not wearing a bra, 
especially since she was supposed to be working with Jacques, but I didn't have the heart to bring it up tonight. Instead, I held her quietly for another 20 minutes until she said she was tired and going to bed. Since it was midnight, I decided to go to bed with her. The next morning, I called in for a personal day. After showering and shaving, I suggested taking Tracy to her office to retrieve her car. However, she seemed shocked and started to stutter before taking a moment to catch her breath and calm down. Instead, she asked me to take her to Shell's place. From there, they planned to take a cab to the office to gather some of Jacques' belongings. Tracy would then drive Shell to the hospital to handle paperwork and collect Jacques' personal items. I offered to assist, but my offer was swiftly declined. That actually worked out pretty well for me. I needed to track down the EMTs who responded to the emergency last night and get a few questions answered. After dropping off Tracy at Chell's place and getting a quick update on how she was doing, I hopped back in the car and headed straight to the hospital. I was able to quickly get the names of the EMTs who handled the emergency and find out where to locate them. I found my targets at the fire station as directed, and they remembered me from the previous night. I looked at the one who had given me Tracy's purse. His name tag read Gage. I asked him directly where the emergency had started. For the second time in a short while, someone stuttered out an answer to me. Well, what do you mean? He asked, suddenly looking suspicious. My wife and Jacques were supposed to be working, but you didn't pick them up at Softel, did you? Is that why you called me wussy? Oh man, I didn't mean anything personal, he said, raising his voice. It's just that we've been on runs where the people checked into a room aren't actually married. And when things go wrong, we get blamed. Don't shoot the messenger. Take it easy, Gage. I'm not trying to blame you. I just want to know the truth. I had to look up wussy, and I didn't like what I found. But that's not your fault. It becomes my problem if you tell me you picked them up anywhere other than Softel. We started the run at the Westside Hotel, Gage replied. They were about 15 minutes into it when the guy suddenly grabbed his chest and collapsed on your wife. She had to push him off to reach the phone and call 911. In the meantime, she gave him mouth to mouth. He was barely alive when we got him to the ER. I had the truth. I didn't need any more. I thanked both of them and left. I could feel their pitying gaze as I walked away. My mind was spinning as I drove home. Tracy was with Jacques when he almost died of a heart attack. How long had this been happening, I wondered. Then it hit me like a bolt of lightning. Our daughter Allison and their daughter Amy didn't just resemble each other by chance. They were sisters. Tracy had been with him for at least 19 years. How could I have been so blind all this time? What a trusting fool I was. Tracy and Jacques often worked late sometimes more than once a week. Then there were the occasional girls' nights out or work crew gatherings. Was she cheating on me with him during all those times? What about on the business trips they went on together? How could Shell not have known? I'll admit, I can be clueless sometimes, but how could she be so blind, especially with the girls looking so much alike? Shell was always involved in the business, Tracy mentioned, dropping by at all hours just to see her husband or her. I thought they were close friends, the way it seemed. How could Tracy betray Chell like that? Tracy's car was in the garage when I got home. She was sitting in the family room, sipping wine as I walked in. My expression must have given away my feelings because she immediately noticed something was off. What's wrong, sweetie? She asked. Although I wanted to stay calm, my anger took over, and I couldn't hold back. How long have you been having an affair with Jacques? I blurted out, my voice filled with venom as I raised my volume. He's Allison's father, isn't he? Tracy dropped her wine glass as she jumped up from the sofa. How, how, how could you say such a horrible thing to me? She screamed, practically charging at me. She stopped just a foot away, her eyes shooting daggers at me. If looks could kill, I would have been dead on the spot. I wasn't backing down. I knew I was right, and I stood my ground, staring back into her eyes. However, I lowered my voice to a whisper as I said, you can tell me to kiss your ass, but don't you dare lie to me and say I'm wrong. If you lie to me, I'll knock your teeth down your throat. Never in our 20 years of marriage, or even before that in our relationship, had I ever cursed at my wife or threatened her physically. To say she was shocked would be an understatement. Her mouth dropped open as if she was going to respond, but then she seemed to realize I was serious, and the lie got stuck in her throat. She also took a step back from me perhaps because it seemed like I had fire in my eyes. You know, you're the reason he's dead, I told her as she sat back down on the sofa, not even bothering about the spilled wine on the carpet. 
The stress of cheating, combined with all that physical activity, probably put too much strain on his heart. I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner, considering how much you two were sleeping together. I could tell by the shocked expression on her face that I had struck a nerve. She looked down at her hands and fidgeted for what felt like minutes, though it was probably only about ten seconds. Oh my god, do you really think I caused his death? She asked softly. I wonder if Chell is thinking the same thing. Why would Chell be thinking that? Unless she knew about you two. Did she know about you two? She knew and was okay with it almost from the start, Tracy said softly. Sometimes she even joined us, especially on business trips. She always thought it was right for me to enjoy time with Jacques for all I did for his business, and she was happy that I took care of him in the office while she looked after him at home. I felt like my head was spinning. I was confused and disoriented. I took a seat to steady myself. So I was the only one left in the dark. Everyone else knew. What about Allison? Allison is known for the past four years. She's okay with it. Oh, man. Allison knows and she's okay with it? That's messed up, I exclaimed. But that's not what I meant. Does Shell know that Allison is Jacques' daughter? Shell knows. And she's fine with it. Even Amy knows. Well, I hope you all got a good laugh at my expense. Even my own daughter knew and didn't tell me. That's just great, I shouted. I stormed out of the house. I ended up driving to a nearby park and just sitting there for a couple of hours. Tracy called my cell a few times, but I ignored the calls and let them go to voicemail. I just sat and thought. I always thought I was pretty smart, but when it came to Tracy, I was completely clueless. I never even considered that she might be cheating on me, and I trusted her so much that I probably missed a bunch of obvious signs for at least 19 years. I felt so stupid. I wondered if there were others besides Jacques. My mind was racing with thoughts. I left the park as it started to get dark and drove home. As I walked into the house from the garage, I could see a small light on in the kitchen above the table. Tracy was sitting in her usual spot with a cup of tea in front of her. She offered me a cup, but I declined and went to my liquor cabinet for something stronger. I poured myself a scotch and sat down in my chair across from her. I can't even begin to tell you how sorry I am for hurting you. Tracy said quietly, looking down at her hands. I need to know everything. Now, I said, with an edge to my voice. You have to explain how you could do this to me while claiming to love me. You have to tell me if you ever truly loved me and respected me. Don't you dare doubt my love for you. Ever, Tracy said urgently. I've always loved you, still do. It's just that I also loved, loved Jacques. Some people think you can only love one person at a time, but I know that's not true because I love two. Spare me. Just get to the point, I said flatly. Tracy had joined Softel when the company was about a year old. Like at many small companies, the few employees wore multiple hats, worked long hours, and grew emotionally close. It was an exciting time for her, and I remembered her telling me about the struggles during our dates. She and I had been dating for about a year when she joined the company. As the company grew and became successful, Tracy became Jacques' right-hand woman, so to speak. He was the dynamic face of the company, while she was the one who kept everything together. She was great at handling multiple tasks, and Jacques relied on her as his other half. While Tracy's relationship with me was heating up outside the office, her relationship with Jacques was also intensifying at work. It seemed like her personal and professional lives were running parallel, she mentioned. Tracy explained that although she and Jacques maintained a professional demeanor in front of their colleagues, they grew even closer when they were alone. They talked about everything, from the mundane to the profound, from Zex to politics. Tracy was 24, beautiful, with an athletic body and long blonde hair. Jacques was 34, a well-built man with long, wavy brown hair, a charming smile, and a courteous manner. So it felt almost natural when they first made love on an old sofa in his office at the end of a long day. Tracy recalled. Tracy said it felt so right that she never felt guilty about being with both me and Jacques, even after we got married a year later. It wasn't just physical attraction. It was a deep emotional connection, similar yet different from the one she and I shared. But she knew she couldn't tell me about it because she knew how strongly I felt about cheating. She loved both of us and didn't want to lose either of us. While I was kept in the dark about the affair, Jacques told Shell about it after about two months. When he and Tracy realized that their relationship was going to be long-term, he wanted to be honest with his wife, who had just given birth to their first child. Jacques told Shell that she and their daughter Amy would always be his top priority, 
but he also wanted to keep a part of his heart reserved for Tracy. Chell then invited Tracy to spend a weekend with Jacques and her. I remember Tracy going away for the weekend pretending to visit her sick mother. And after that weekend, Chell gave her approval to the affair. When Tracy got pregnant several years later, it was Shell who comforted her and decided on the story if the child turned out to be Jacques. Since both Jacques and I had A-plus blood, that part was easy. And since I rarely spent time alone with both girls together, if anyone noticed their resemblance, Chell or Tracy would joke about me getting around, passing it off as coincidence. They knew I might get suspicious if I thought about it too much. Chell saw Tracy almost like a younger sister and was proud of Jacques' little family, Tracy mentioned. I was speechless during Tracy's revelation, or rather, her recollection, as she didn't show any remorse for what she had done. She was just remembering events. Tracy stopped talking, expecting a response from me. The only thing that came to mind was to ask if she and Jacques had taken a break when we were first married and having Zex almost every day of the week. She looked embarrassed and glanced away before admitting they hadn't. That was such an exciting time in my life. I had two handsome men who loved me and desired me, and I was extremely horny all the time, she said. On the days when Jacques and I made love, I always made sure to clean myself really well down there in case we were going to have Zex too. Yes, sometimes you did get sloppy seconds, but I tried to keep that to a minimum, and I never let you go down on me after Jacques and I made love. Awfully considerate of you, I mumbled. The funny thing is, after all these years, I never really compared the two of you sexually, she continued. You were both good lovers, kind and attentive, and about the same size. It wasn't better Zex with Jacques, just different, because of who each of you are. We're... I have to admit, I felt a bit relieved knowing it wasn't just a physical thing with a stranger. But at the same time, her admission that she loved him as well as me cut me to the core. I was raised to believe in loyalty to one person, one soulmate for each of us. And even though I might have been the one closest to her, there was someone else sharing that intimacy with me. Tracy set down her tea and locked eyes with me, as if searching for answers in my soul. I didn't have any response to her unspoken question, nor any wise words to offer. I put away my duars, left my glass in the sink, and went upstairs to bed. Though why, I couldn't say, because I knew I wouldn't get any sleep that night. Tracy joined me in bed about five minutes later, snuggling up behind me. I pretended to be asleep so I wouldn't have to say goodnight. I got up at my usual 5 a.m., went through my morning routine, and headed off to work. Tracy was still in bed when I left, so it seemed she wasn't planning to go to Softel. I guess she and Shell will need to figure out what to do next with Jacques gone. That's their issue. Clearly, I had my own problem to sort out. Work has always been my refuge when life gets tough, and I hoped it would stay that way. I work at Mayon Pharmaceuticals as the vice president of sales. Even though I'm 45, I'm considered part of the new breed in the industry. My background is in chemistry, so... Unlike many in sales, I actually understand how our products are made and what they do. I've even helped create one of our products, Cock Crazitol, which lowers women's libidos. It's been a big seller, and I've made good money from it. I also make a very nice salary, and with Tracy's nice salary, we were doing very well for ourselves. Upscale house in a trendy neighborhood, two nice cars, great vacations. Neither one of us will be hurting financially when we get divorced. There it was, the dreaded D word. I hadn't really thought about divorce until that moment, but once I found out Tracy was cheating, it seemed inevitable. With Allison away at college, there didn't seem to be much holding us together. Aside from the pain Tracy caused me, splitting up shouldn't be a big deal. My boss, Arnold Kramer, and I have been colleagues for 18 years. After working as a chemist at another pharmaceutical company for five years, I met Arnie at an industry convention. We hit it off and he suggested I try sales. Then he offered me a job at his company and I decided to take on the challenge. Arnie was absolutely right about my abilities, and we've both reaped the rewards. Not only do we make a great team at work, but he's also turned out to be a fantastic friend. We've built a bond that I hope will last a lifetime. Arnie's been married to his wife, Lauren, for around 30 years. They have two grown kids and five grandkids. At 52, he's got the energy of a 30-year-old and a sharp mind to match. He's not just smart himself. He's not afraid to surround himself with other bright minds like mine, I'd like to believe. Arnie looked devastated when I told him Tracy had cheated on me and that I was going to divorce her. He asked if I was certain she had cheated, and I confirmed it. He didn't press for details, and I didn't offer any. We agreed to talk more later, and he understood that. However, he did pull out a card for the attorney who represents Mayone from his card file. Arnie is extremely loyal to people who have done good work for him. 
And he trusted the team at Mayone, especially their small division specializing in divorce cases for individuals in better financial standing. He suggested I take whatever time off I needed, but I assured him I would only require a few hours here and there, since this should be a straightforward case. After all, we lived in a no-fault state. Both of us wanted to do right by Allison, and we each had our own pension plans we could keep. We could split the proceeds from the house. Man, I totally messed up. When I got back home from work that night, Tracy had dinner all set out, my favorite, Spaghetti Supreme, and she even opened a nice bottle of Merlot. Everything seemed so nice that I didn't have the heart to remind her that Jacques was the wine expert. I prefer my drinks stronger. I guess it's hard to keep everything straight when you're juggling two lovers. Tracy was her usual talkative self during dinner, acting like nothing had changed between us. I waited about 10 minutes before stopping the act, finally saying those dreaded four words no spouse ever wants to hear. We need to talk. No, we don't, she practically snapped back at me. I have to admit I was shocked by her response and her tone. I had caught her, and she admitted to, having a decades-long affair with her boss. She knew how I felt about cheating. How could she think I would stay with her? I was hoping we could at least talk like civilized adults before I have you served, I said to her as calmly as I could. You can do whatever you like about having me served. I'm not giving you a divorce, she said with more than a hint of irritation in her voice. The bottom line is, you love me and I love you, and I won't let you go. I'll fight this every step of the way. You're being stupid and going to ruin the best thing you've ever had, all because your pride is wounded. I started to respond, but she wasn't done and cut me off. Up until you found out about Jacques and me, did I ever give you one reason to doubt my love for you? Did I ever treat you badly in any way? You always got as much good zex as you wanted, and I made sure I took care of you in every way. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Aren't we each other's best friends? If you hadn't found out by chance, you would have gone to your grave loving me completely until your last breath. You would never have known. Can't we just go back to that? No, because I did find out. You don't love me as much as you say you do. Because otherwise, you wouldn't have given yourself to another man, both body and soul. You knew it was wrong, so you kept it hidden from me. I don't call two decades of deception love. Bad enough you've been having sex with another man for two decades, but you also admit to loving him. You've been intimate with him in ways you've been intimate with me. How is that loving me? Forget the sex for a moment if you can. Don't you see that every bit of love you gave him you were taking from me? I had more than enough love for the both of you, Tracy yelled back at me. He was man enough to understand that, but I knew you wouldn't, so I never told you, and now you're proving me right. Man enough? I wasn't man enough because I wouldn't let you have a Zex partner and semi-husband on the side. That's nonsense. I wasn't foolish enough to allow you to do that to me willingly. So you made that choice yourself, for yourself, entirely for yourself. This was all about what you wanted, and you got it. And trust me, if I hadn't found out, I would have lived my life thinking everything was perfect, while being the world's biggest fool. You could have just put it on my damn tombstone. Here lies Rick Avondale, world's happiest fool. He thought life was wonderful because he had no clue his wife had two husbands. The viewing and funeral were three days later, on a Monday. I didn't go to either. I got up like any other morning and went to work. When I got home, Tracy and Allison were still in the kitchen wearing the same clothes from the funeral. I went over to my daughter, who had come home from college to attend, and tried to give her a hug. It had been about two months since she was last home. I say tried, because the hug never happened. At first, she pulled away from my touch, then she turned her back on me and moved away, quietly crying. Tracy put her hand on my arm and shook her head gently. Normally, I would have taken the hint and let it go, but these weren't normal circumstances anymore. I growled, literally under my breath. I went upstairs to the bedroom, packed enough clothes for several days, grabbed my toothbrush and hygiene supplies, and left. Tracy started blowing up my phone almost as soon as I left. I ignored all the calls and let them go to voicemail. I had to give Allison credit for one thing, though. Unlike her mother, she wasn't pretending everything was going to be okay. Somewhere along the line, she decided I was the bad guy in this situation, and she was going to make me pay. Well, if she wanted to make me pay by breaking my heart, she succeeded. Not only was she not my biological child, but she also made it clear she was no longer my child emotionally. This just keeps getting worse by the minute. On Tuesday, I took some time off work, went to the bank, and divided all the accounts into hers and mine. 
I closed our joint credit cards, opened a new one in my name only, and scheduled an appointment with the lawyer recommended by Arnie. He managed to fit me in for Thursday. I hadn't slept in three days when I went to see the lawyer on Thursday. Funny enough, his name was Mike Squelch. I hoped he was better at lawyering than his name suggested. Honestly, I didn't think there was much to talk about. I gave him all the details about the affair and said I wanted out with my fair share as soon as possible. I also insisted on suing Jacques' estate for child support. If she wasn't my child anymore, then her real father should step up. I'm done being taken advantage of, I told Mike. Mike didn't see any issues with my plan, but he warned that if Tracy refused to get a divorce, a judge might require counseling and drag things out. I told him to go ahead anyway. Then, on Monday of the following week, Tracy was served papers at Softel. I'm guessing it was at 10.07 a.m., because at 10.08 our receptionist said that an angry Tracy was on line three. I hadn't been responding to any of Tracy's calls or texts on my cell phone all week. I had instructed the Mayone folks to send her calls straight to my voicemail, which they had been doing. But I knew I couldn't avoid her forever, so I told Marlene, our head receptionist, to put her calls directly through to me. You unbelievable asshole! I hung up the phone as soon as she finished her first curse. Fifteen seconds later, phone call number two came. Don't you dare hang up this! I hung up again, wondering how long it would take her to realize she had to be civil if she wanted to talk to me. Phone call number three took a bit longer to come through. When I answered, she was practically whispering, trying hard to keep herself in check. You win round one. We need to talk, she said. That's just great, I replied as cheerfully as possible. Call my attorney, Mike Squelch, and set up an appointment to see us. You might want to bring your own attorney along too. It could speed up the process. The appointment was set for two weeks later. Until then, I stayed at a nearby motel, occasionally visiting my old house to mow the lawn and collect mail and more of my belongings. The first time Tracy saw me arrive at the house, she tried to greet me like her long-lost husband and started to hug me in the driveway. I physically pushed her away and walked into the house. You didn't have to air our issues right out there in the driveway, did you? She asked. Hey, if I'm such a jerk, then divorce me, I deadpanned. The meeting with the attorneys happened on a Friday afternoon at three. Being the gentleman, I let Tracy speak first. She went on about loving me completely, but also keeping a little place in her heart for Jacques. And now that he was gone, she claimed everything would be about me all the time. Are you really willing to throw away 20 great years over this? She asked me. Could our love have meant so little to you? No, it's because our love meant so much to me that we have to end this marriage, I replied. You had my heart completely and deceived me to get it. How can I not see this as a total betrayal of trust, the very foundation of a marriage? You knew what you were doing was wrong, yet you betrayed my trust to get what you wanted, both of us physically and emotionally. But he knew and accepted it, while I was fooled into it by deception. This divorce isn't my fault. It's about your selfishness and betrayal. I could never tolerate sharing you physically with another man, but sharing your love with him crosses an even bigger line. It hurts more than if you had just had a fling with someone. You loved him, slept with him, and even had his child. Just because I didn't know doesn't make it right. You were both taking from me. It's a good thing he died of a heart attack that day. Because if he didn't, I would have shot him. Tracy gasped when I said this, and I was already in tears. You know, throughout all of this, you never once said you were sorry for cheating on me, I continued. You apologized for hurting me, and I know you're sorry you got caught, but... I don't think you're sorry at all about what you did. Rick, I know we can work things out. Please don't go through with this divorce, she pleaded. Our part, it was our marriage, Tracy. There wasn't supposed to be our part and your part. It was just supposed to be us, forever. Mike glanced at Tracy's attorney and said, I think we're done here. Your client needs to sign the paperwork and return it to us. Tracy's attorney, a serious-looking middle-aged African-American woman, nodded solemnly and extended her hand for Mike to shake. Some minor details were sorted out over the next two weeks, and we were officially divorced about three months later. Two days after the divorce was finalized, I had Mike file a lawsuit against Jacques' estate for what essentially amounted to child support and college expenses, though it sounded fancier in legal terms. I probably wouldn't have taken this step if Allison hadn't made it crystal clear after the funeral that she wanted nothing to do with me anymore. I had raised that kid as my own for 18 years, and this is the respect I get? But I guess she had four years to stew over it after Tracy spilled the beans, and in her eyes, I was no better than a fool. 14 years of genuine fatherly love, all down the drain. So, 
No, I wasn't the least bit offended when Mike suggested we make up for the lost respect with some real money, $1 million to be precise. I admired Mike's attitude. I expected a call from Chell when she was served, but instead I got one from Tracy. Chell probably thought I'd take the message better coming from Tracy, but she guessed wrong. Was this just another way to get back at me? Are you hurting for money? Tracy said when I answered. Well, hello to you too, Mrs. Avondale. So nice of you to call. It's not like I didn't know why she was calling. You do realize this makes you look like a total jerk, right? She commented. You do realize I raised another man's child for 18 years while you, Shell, and Jacques were having a good laugh at my expense? And now that other man's child thinks I'm nothing more than a fool? I don't give a damn about what any of you think. I hung up without saying goodbye. I'm guessing Tracy told Shell about my stance and how stubborn I can be when I'm convinced I'm right. So after her lawyer tried to negotiate with Mike, she just wrote me a check for the million dollars. As it turned out, a few months later, Shell could easily afford that million because she sold Softel to a Japanese company for $8 million. With Jacques no longer running things, it was probably a smart business move. That's where the story could have ended. But as the old newsman Paul Harvey used to say, and now for the rest of the story. Two days after the sale of Softel, $2 million was deposited into an account in my name in the Cayman Islands. It was my finder's fee for Nakatomi Limited acquiring Softel within nine months after an anonymous Nakatomi attorney and I signed a deal stating just that, regardless of how it happened and what role I had in it. If Nakatomi had bought Softel by a certain date, I would get a finder's fee. After that date, the deal was off. So by now, you're probably wondering how I played a role in the Softel deal. It's a bit complicated, but here's the gist of it. I wasn't entirely honest with you earlier in this story. Much of what I've told you is true but some of it was based on a performance that could have won an Academy Award by me, the guy who seemed completely clueless. Let me explain. I really was clueless up until about a month before Jacques died. That's when a certain attorney from Nakatomi approached me, seeking my help in brokering a deal with Jacques for Softel. Why do you want my help, besides the fact that my wife works closely with Jacques? I asked innocently. Because we know you're a smart man, and we think you'd be up for the challenge and the payday for outsmarting the man who's been cheating on you for years behind your back, the attorney said. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. Tracy was cheating on me, and this guy from Japan knew about it? Are you kidding me? Turns out Nakatomi had been researching several firms, and when these guys research, they leave no stone unturned. They easily uncovered Jacques and Tracy's affair, along with Chell and both daughters' involvement. They figured, rightly so, that I'd be more than willing to assist them. But it had to be done quickly because they were considering other software firms, and I had to deliver within a nine-month time frame. First, they presented me with evidence of Tracy's infidelity. Photos, videos, phone records, trip receipts, everything. I had everything I needed to expose them both. And then they sweetened the deal. I was financially stable, so I didn't necessarily need the money, but they offered me $2 million to help them oust Jacques from the company. By then, I would have helped them for free, but I wasn't about to admit that. I just had to plan my strategy and ensure the money came to me after the divorce, so I wouldn't have to split it since we live in a no-fault state. But first, I had to calm myself down to avoid giving myself away. My initial reaction was to wait for their next rendezvous, break in and shoot them both. But spending the rest of my life as Bubba's cellmate didn't appeal to me. So I had to keep my cool and act like I didn't know a thing, something I'd been doing for 20 years already. So what's a little longer? I told Arnie about Tracy and Jacques, but I didn't spill how I found out. We sat around late one night at the plant with a bottle of Don Julio tequila tossing around ideas. After downing about half the bottle, he looked at me seriously and said, Damn son, isn't it messed up that the guy who invented cock crazitol has his wife messing around with another man? You should have slipped some of that stuff to her, Rick. That's when it hit me, although I didn't mention it to Arnie for obvious reasons. Not to her, I thought to myself. I should have slipped some of that stuff to him. Hey, wait a minute. Two birds with one stone. One great thing about Cockcrazitol is that unlike most big drugs, it doesn't have many side effects. In fact, there's only one if taken correctly. Men shouldn't take it at all because, while it quiets a woman's libido, it can cause a fatal heart attack due to a spike in blood pressure. I just needed to get some into Jacques' hands. Jacques and I both belong to the same golf course and we occasionally play together with two other guys as a foursome. I arranged a foursome for us the next Saturday, with a stop at the restaurant for lunch after the first nine holes. The first nine holes were good, 
and we had about 90 minutes for lunch and drinks before our second nine tea time. Now, you've got to remember, I'm a pretty good salesman. So while we were sitting there eating and drinking, I casually glanced over at Jacques and said, Hey buddy, you okay? You look a little tired. The other two guys and I were all about 10 years younger than Jacques, and he knew it, so yeah, the question got to him a bit. I could see him thinking when I suggested we push back the next tea time by 30 minutes to give him more rest. Nah, I'm just a little tired, but we don't need to change anything for me. I'm good, he replied. Actually, I didn't think he looked tired at all, but now I was playing into his insecurity about being the oldest in the group. Got just the thing for you, buddy, I said, as I pulled out a small bag of unmarked white pills from my front left pants pocket. A little something I keep just for myself and take every day with lunch. Helps me breeze through the rest of the day. I handed Jacques the bag with five pills in it. Take one of these for the next few days, and if you like them, I'll get you some more next time we hit the links. Jacques slid one out of the bag, popped it into his mouth, and washed it down with his bourbon over ice. He thumped his chest like Tarzan and let out a small yell. Let's go, boys, I'm feeling pumped, he exclaimed good-naturedly. Actually, within a few minutes, he probably did feel pumped, in a way. An increase in blood pressure can get you fired up, which is why athletes focus on getting hyped for their game. But too much of a good thing. For those wondering why I gave him a small baggie instead of a pill bottle or a pill box, here's the reason. I wanted him to throw the baggie away after finishing the pills, rather than keeping it around. This way, it wouldn't be found in his pocket if someone went through his clothes when the inevitable happened on Wednesday night. For those paying attention, those five pills would last until Wednesday, which was the usual night for the Jacques Tracy rendezvous. Combine a man's already heightened blood pressure from a romantic encounter with a woman who isn't his wife, with medication that further raises and spikes blood pressure, and you've got the recipe for a heart attack, most likely fatal. But since it would appear as a regular heart attack, and since we live in a small city without a big crime scene investigation unit, it would only be investigated further if something seemed fishy or out of place. So I made sure to play my role of the betrayed husband to the fullest, acting exactly as I did when I first found out about the affair a month prior. I have to admit, I even impressed myself with my acting skills. Two days after the money hit my account and was promptly transferred to another account, I treated Arnie and his wife to a lavish dinner. Ostensibly, it was to thank Arnie for being a great boss and supporting me in my time of need. He didn't need to know it was actually my way of thanking him for planting the seed of my revenge. With Jacques out of both women's lives, the connection between Tracy and Shell cooled off significantly, especially when Shell had time to dwell on the fact that Jacques had died practically in Tracy's arms. I also heard that Shell got pretty mad when she realized Tracy couldn't persuade me to drop my lawsuit against the estate for back child support. However, Shell probably didn't know that Tracy wasn't getting any of that money because we were already divorced by then. Chell fired Tracy shortly after she paid me the support money, and word got around in their circles about Jacques and Tracy's affair, thanks to the Nakatomi guys. This pretty much put an end to Tracy's career in business administration. It's never a good thing when your boss dies in bed with you, I've heard. Don't feel too sorry for Tracy, though. She ended up with a net worth of about $1 million from all of this, so she won't be struggling financially anytime soon. Plus, she can help out her daughter. Yes, I said her daughter. Allison made it crystal clear to me that she wanted nothing to do with me after Jacques died. She turned me down not just once, but multiple times. I guess that's the thanks I get for raising her, providing for her, coaching her soccer teams, and attending all of her dance recitals. Oh well, I won't make that mistake again. As for me, I guess I'm doing all right for a guy who lost the love of his life after 20 years. It took me some time, but I finally started dating again. I'm just not sure if I'll ever be able to fully trust another woman, and I'm not sure if I'll ever find someone who measures up to what I thought I had with Tracy, but at least I'm free to do as I please. I'm worth about $5 million, so I've semi-retired, and now only work on special projects for May Ione. Maybe one day I'll invent a pill that helps clueless husbands spot a cheating wife immediately. Now that would truly benefit mankind.